we're in the series titled The King and His Kingdom. The King and His Kingdom. And today the truth is this. Jesus is a king like no other. He's a king like no other. Now we're going to be introduced to a, to a king, King Herod, in just a moment. But Jesus is a king like no other. Matthew chapter 2. That's where we're at. Matthew chapter 2. Begin in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. Pause for, for a moment. After Jesus was, was born, begs the question, What's happened? What time frame are we looking at here? An answer was given, and, and I would agree, probably around one years of age. Now, we don't know exactly. The text doesn't say exactly, but what we will see is that King Herod, this wicked King Herod, sent this decree. He made this order to murder all boys in the Bethlehem region two years and younger, two years and younger. What we'll also see in a moment is they're no longer in the manger scene. They've moved on to the big house, right? They've entered the house. We're going to see that in just a moment. But after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Bethlehem is significant. We'll see here in a moment why it's significant. But Bethlehem um, in, in, in Judea, then we see in the days of King Herod. Who is King Herod? King Herod was a wicked man. He was a wicked man ruler. King Herod was not a Jew. In fact, Jews despised King Herod. They hated King Herod. King Herod killed his Hasmonean wife. King Herod uh, killed two of his sons. King Herod killed his brother-in-law. And from his deathbed, ordered the prominent citizens be arrested and killed so that when he died, there would be weeping. That's King Herod. It was said, it's safer to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. That was his reputation. And so as we, as we read this text, as we read Matthew chapter 2, uh, we'll, we'll really see it come to, to life, uh, come to life here in just, just a moment. But this is King Herod. Herod, we see, verse 1, wise men from the east, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem. Now, most of us grew up thinking there was three wise men. I mean, show of hands. If you're online, maybe put it in the chat, but show of hands in the house. How many of y'all think there's three? I mean, you got your nativity set. I mean, you just put it away, or, or maybe it's out. No shame, no shame, okay, all year round. More power to you. What, what, yeah, but uh, uh, you, you have the, you know, you have those three. You, you protect those three. I, I like to like bridge the gap often be, between the wise men and, and the manger scene. Like put the, put the wise men like 10 feet away because they're still on the journey, right? But uh, typically we have come up with three wise men because there's three gifts. We're going to see that in a moment. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They bring these three gifts. And so that's where, that's where we've come up with this. But we don't know. Show me in the scriptures, you can't, uh, but try. Show me in the scriptures where this idea of three, other than the three, three gifts. We just, we just don't know. We know that there's wise men, and uh, we also know that they're not kings. They served at the, at the pleasure of the king and, and the royal courts. And so this song that we've sung, maybe we need to stop singing. I don't know, or you can keep singing it, whatever you want to do. We three kings of Orient are, uh, you know, um, based on this line of thinking, it's, it's false. But nevertheless... Wise men. The term wise men comes from magi, comes from magi, which refers to ma magicians or astronomers or astrologers. We're going to see that these men, they knew, they knew the stars, they knew the constellations, they, they were guided, and so they were aware of the, the seasons. Within the Medo-Persian Empire, within the Medo-Persian Empire, magi were regarded as valuable advisors due to their knowledge of science, of agriculture, uh, even sorcery. Most biblical scholars believe that these wise men that we read about in Matthew chapter 2 made a 900-mile journey 
from the east. Oftentimes the east is uh, associated with Babylon. And so scholars, scholars even go as far as to say perhaps it was the same route as Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 when he left the land of Ur to come to the, end, uh, to the land of, of Canaan. This long journey. Let that sink in just for a moment. 900 mile journey to see this king of the Jews. 900 mile journey to present this king with these with these gifts. Verse 2. They came to Jerusalem. Saying where is he who has been born king of the Jews. We saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. Now when they, when they said this. You could just imagine what would happen to a man like King Herod. I mean they were wise. I'm assuming they knew who they were dealing with. <laughs> Uh, we're going to see they outsmart him in just a moment. But can you imagine? Hey, we're looking for the king of the Jews. Now, this would have been an automatic threat to King Herod. In fact, King Herod was willing to kill anyone that threatened his position. We, we've already discussed that. I mean, even the people closest to him, born from him, he took their life. Look at verse 3, when King Herod heard this, when he heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Now, I, I wonder, one of my questions, I don't know if you have a list of questions when we meet the Lord, you know, you're going to, I don't know how we take them, it's a glorified body, but <laughs> that's, a, that was, that's a bad joke. And so, um, but, but I, I had this thought, you know, what, what, what is it about all Jerusalem? If all Jerusalem hated this king, then why are they disturbed with them? Uh, maybe because of the, the roar of panic that might come through uh, based on once he finds out this information, what is he going to do with it? Perhaps King Herod heard this, was deeply disturbed, all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Christ would be born. He didn't know, but he knew people that would know. And so he gathers these people up and he asks this question, where the Christ would be born. Verse 5, in Bethlehem of Judea, they told him. It's kind of like a, maybe a dumb moment. I, they probably didn't do that with the king. But in Bethlehem of Judea, they told him because this is what was written by the prophet. You see this in verse 6. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. This, verse 6, is the first of four prophecies. The first of four prophecies in Matthew chapter 2 that are fulfilled with the birth of Jesus. You see Bethlehem. Why is Bethlehem significant? Well, if you go back and you recall, Bethlehem is where Jacob buried his wife, whom he loved and favored, Rachel. It, it was through Rachel that Joseph and Benjamin uh, were born. And so Bethlehem is where Jacob buried Rachel. Bethlehem is also where Ruth... You know the story of Ruth, the Old Testament book of Ruth. It's where, it's where Ruth met and married Boaz. Bethlehem is known as the city of David. Bethlehem means house of bread. Now, hold on, uh, you know, 1030 crowd. Don't, 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 don't lose me now, you know. And some of y'all may be doing a no carb, so we're good, right? Maybe that's just temptation. I don't, I don't know. But Bethlehem, Bethlehem means house of bread. It's known as the bread basket of Israel, right? The bed, bread basket of Israel. It's, it's where wheat was grown. And it's appropriate that the bread of life would come from the bread basket of Israel. John chapter 6, verse 35, would you write that reference down? Hold on to it. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. This is what Jesus is saying. This is what Jesus has to offer. Hey, you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you starving? 
come to me, find fulfillment, find satisfaction, and the bread of life would be born in the bread basket of Israel. Micah chapter 5, and in Micah chapter 5 is where this first prophecy comes from, verse 6. This was written some 700 years prior to this moment. Some 700 years prior to this moment, the prophet Micah, the man of God who spoke on the behalf of God to the people of God. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, Bethlehem, Epiphrath, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of the ruler's brothers will return to the people of Israel. He will stand and shepherd them in the strength of the Lord, in the majestic name of the Lord his God. They will live securely, for then his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth. Listen to the first part of verse 5. He will be their peace. This is a prophecy given some 700 years prior to the birth and arrival of Christ. And Jesus is, is born. He's born. He's moved from the manger to the house. And, and this King Herod, this evil King Herod, is asking, where? Where is he? Where is he? Verse 7. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them, the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I can too go and worship him. King Herod is trying to outsmart the smartest men. <laughs> you ever try to do that? You think you're so cunning, man. I, I got to be honest. There's always somebody smarter, okay? Can we, can we, just, say, can we just say it? There's always somebody smarter, uh, the need for humility is great among us. Amen? <laughs> and so here's King Herod in his pompous attitude, his arrogance. He's trying, to, he's trying to set a trap. He's trying to set a trap. And we'll see that these wise men, they, they are wise and they indeed don't go back to report. They're going to go another route. Look at verse Look at verse 10. When they saw the star, excuse me, verse 9, after hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. We, we must pause. We must pause right here and just consider the greatness of our God. I pray that when we sing songs like what we just sang, we're singing it out of a place of acknowledging how great, good our God is. I pray that we as the church will live lives of worship, that it will not be reduced to an hour on a Sunday. But as the church, ones who have been saved and set free, rescued from the domain of darkness, transferred into the marvelous light, I pray that you and I will live lives of worship for the king. And in doing so, we must take a step back and acknowledge that there is only one over everything. And it is the Lord our God. He is great. And he is glorious. Can you just imagine in the sovereignty of God, in the greatness of God, that God would place this star in the perfect position. Can, can we agree that you and I cannot do that? <laughs> I, I hope so. And if you can't, we, we need to talk later, okay? Uh, we cannot do that. We, we desperately must rely on the power, sovereignty, all sufficiency of creator God. Trust him. And whatever you're going through today, Trust him. I'm not, I'm not downing the size of what you're facing. No, we're all going through some challenges. And right now today, there are some in the house and online that that challenge is just, it is bigger. But will you trust him? 
The same God that would take this star and perfectly place it over the place where Jesus was is the same God who is still on his throne, ruling and reigning over all creation. What is your provision? Uh, What is your need today? And will you trust God to provide uh, for that need? Verse 10, when they saw the star, what do you think their response was? They were overwhelmed with joy. I mean, could you just imagine they're making this journey? It's a short journey, by the way. Made it several times on on a bus (laughs) and uh, from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. And um, but could you just imagine when they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with with joy, with joy. Hey, joy, joy comes from joy comes from Jesus. Do you remember Luke chapter two, verse 10? The angels appeared to the shepherds as they were watching over the flock by night scared the mess out of them. And, but what did the angels declare to the shepherds that night? We bring you good news of great joy. We bring you good news of great joy. We see the star is positioned. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Joy comes from Jesus Look at verse 11. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So they enter this house, and what do they do? The very first thing they do is fall to their knees. They fall to their knees. It's, a, it's a, the posture of worship. In fact, every time we read the word worship in the Old Testament, The literal translation in the Hebrew is that to bow down. Why? Out of respect. Out of how how big God is and how little we are, we're to bow humbly before him. Paul calls the church to be clothed in humility. How can we know what God's will is and, and, and act in it? How can we live lives of worship without humility? It it can't happen. How can we point others to the good news? With great joy, apart from humility, we can't. We can't. So they bow down. They enter the house. They, they bow down. And they present these three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These three gifts. Have you ever considered, what's the significance about these gifts? Again, they have made this incredibly long journey from the east, seeking the king of the Jews. And what do they do? They present him with three gifts. The first is gold. I mean, not much needs to be said about gold. We, we, can, we can understand. I mean, that's why we shop online, you know, for the fake stuff, because we can't afford the real stuff. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, <laughs> gold, gold was a valued commodity in the ancient world. It's still a valued commodity today. Last I saw the per ounce today, this morning, per ounce, per ounce, $2,000. I mean, I don't, know, I don't know what you got in your pocket, but uh, it's not here, okay? So uh, per ounce, it, it's, a, it's a valued commodity. And what do they do? They present the king of the Jews with gold. They present him with, with gold. Gold was always reserved for, for royalty. They knew something about him. They knew something about him. What do you know about him? And so many times we come, I mean, we come, it's like, oh, God, I'll give you a little, you know, I'll give you like the... You know, I'll give you the 50 cent, you know, like, <laughs> and, uh, but, but, but I'm keeping the rest. And now they, they brought the king of the Jews, these three, these three gifts, the first gold set aside for royalty. Second was frankincense. Frankincense is, it's an incense that when burned creates a strong aroma for some, it's a lovely aroma for others. Not so lovely. Uh, I've, I've smelt it all over Jerusalem I, and you know what? It's not for me. I, that's all I got to say. It's not for me. Um, but the. But nevertheless, the, the cost of frank, frankincense, don't, don't, don't miss this, the cost of fr- frankincense prevented it from being used in, in the common home. And they just, they just couldn't afford it. And so frankincense was often set aside and burnt uh, when people would worship whatever God that they worshiped. They would burn these frankincense in the east. And, and so it was, it, and then it was used in the tabernacle. Frankincense was then used in the, uh, uh, in the temple. It's used for worship in the temple. And, uh, and I believe these wise men knew 
this baby. They knew this king. They knew there was something about him. They present him with gold and they present him with frankincense. And that frankincense would later then be used in the temple to the worship of Christ who would be our high priest. The temple would have a high priest. People would come for the forgiveness of sins. And when Jesus came, he is now our high priest who went to the cross to shed his blood, was placed in a grave and rose victorious so that you and I could be made right and forgiven of all of our sins. We don't need another priest. He's the only one. We don't need another mediator. He is the man, Paul writes to Timothy. He is the man, Jesus Christ himself, who's the mediator between man and God. It's Jesus. The wise men knew something about him. Next, uh, myrrh. Myrrh is a fragrant spice. Comes from a sap of a tree native to the Near East. And myrrh was used to anoint dead bodies. And here, these wise men enter the house. You with me? And they bow down to pay homage, to worship, to adore Jesus, the king of the Jews, the one they've been seeking. And they give him gold set aside for royalty. And they give him frankincense set aside for the worship as the fragrance would rise up. And then the third, they give him myrrh set aside to anoint dead bodies. I just wonder if you'd consider the connection here with these three gifts. This last one, myrrh. Somehow, some way, is it possible that the wise men would know that Jesus has come to die? That Jesus was born to die. Myrrh, to anoint the dead bodies. Jesus' body, after he was crucified on the cross, would be laid out and it would be anointed with myrrh. But praise be to God, he wouldn't stay dead in that grave. He would rise victorious on the third day. Amen. Dustin Binge says the manger is empty. The cross is empty. The tomb is empty is empty. The throne is occupied for eternity. There's only one king. His name is Jesus. And he is a king like no other. Look to verse 13. We see that they return home. The wise men return home. Verse 13, after they were gone, An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, get up. This is the first time in Matthew 2 that an angel appears to Joseph. Says, get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to kill him. So he got up. So he got up the first time. In response to the Lord, he gets up. What's the Lord leading you to do? You better obey. Get up. So he got up, took the child, verse 14, and his mother during the night and escaped to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod's death so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, this is the second prophecy, the second Old Testament prophecy that will be fulfilled in this account of Matthew chapter 2. It was written some 750 years prior to this moment. Hosea chapter 11 verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. I called my son. Look at verse 16. Then Herod, when he realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men. Here we go, right? You're waiting for it. Flew into a rage. He gave orders to massacre all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under. In keeping with the time, he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. Jeremiah, verse 18, Jeremiah 31, 15, a voice from 
was heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because they are no more. It's already been stated how wicked a king this was, how wicked King Herod was. We see it's clear how wicked he was when he, when, when, when he was outwitted, outsmarted. I mean, by the wise man, he should have known what was coming, but hey, that's, that, that, that's, that's not the point. Uh, he flies into this rage, and what does he do? He, this horrific decree that I'm going to kill him. One way or another, he's dead. And so he sends this decree out, orders this decree all boys two years and younger in the region of Bethlehem are to be killed. That's how wicked a man, this man, this king is. Today is, today is National Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. It's an opportunity to pause and just remind the church that we are for life to remind the church there's a call to action, to, to call the church to action. As I was preparing for this message, praying through the text, praying actually on Wednesday morning here at 8.30, our doors are open. Anyone may join us and you're encouraged and invited to join us to pray. But that's what we do from 8.30 to 9, we pray. I get if you're a job somewhere, you could stop at 8.30, maybe, maybe not. At <laughs> some point, pray with us. But we pray, and we pray. We pray from 8.30 to 9 o'clock, and as, as we were praying, um, somehow I started thinking about this text, and, uh, and I started writing, just writing some notes in this time of prayer, and so I'll just read you what I wrote Wednesday morning who will speak for those that do not have a voice, for those that cannot act, for those who are vulnerable and weak. The massacre of, of these babies is heartbreaking in Matthew chapter 2. We can do nothing about those that were killed over 2,000 years ago. But we can do something about the thousands that are being killed every day. So, I want to invite Stephanie to share for a moment. Stephanie's a part of our church. Stephanie's on the board of CareNet. CareNet is one of the organizations that we support. And Stephanie, I praise God for you and your life and your service to the Lord and how you are the voice and leading the churches to be a voice. So, would you welcome Stephanie just for a moment? Good morning. Thank you very much. Beautiful, beautiful sermon this morning. May I have a show of hands? You're going to have to participate with me for a second. How many of you are living and breathing? I hear some laughter. Come on now. We're, all, we're not dead yet, right? <clears throat> Life is the very first foundational right that God gave you when you were only one cell. It's called a zygote. Did you know you were a zygote? You're not anymore. You're a living, breathing human being. And if you're living and breathing, you are not on the sidelines. You are a leader in the fight for life because you have been given life by God, not by men. I know that because the Supreme Court overturned Roe that we feel like we can stop fighting for life. But the Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy and the lies and deception are his only tools that he has. So don't be deceived that this fight is over. In fact, I'm going to the Capitol as of today. Karenet and I are headed up to the Capitol and we're going to fight for life. We're going to go and talk to the legislators and we do make a difference and you do make a difference too. So please pray for us this week as we go. The lie in 1992 in the presidential campaign promoting abortion to be safe legal and rare, it is not safe for the baby. And as far as rare, as of today, there have been 65 million abortions since 1972. And now 
Those advocating for abortion are advocating for up to birth and right after birth. That's called infanticide. But how do we combat lies? We combat it with the truth, with the word of God, and just speaking truth to those that are hurting. Abortion isn't safe for the baby, but what about the mother? They say it's health care. I know from my own experience, and I've spoken to you all a little bit about this before. I've had two abortions, and that's what makes my voice so strong, is that I had these abortions, and I suffered both mentally and physically. Just a little example in my own story about the harm of the abortion to the mother. After I was married, I was misdiagnosed with bipolar. Abortion was not only mentally harming me, it was also physically harmful for the harsh meds that I didn't know, that I really didn't need that were pumping through my body. Thank God, and I want everybody to hear this, listen closely. He revealed that the anger and the roller coaster of emotions was not bipolar. It was unresolved grief. I had lost something at my own demise and at my own hands, but I had lost something that was precious. It was life, and it made me angry, even at my own choice. Let me just say that if you're here today with an abortion in your past, having had one, or for the men having paid for one or encouraged someone to have one, God wants you to not be afraid to be free from the guilt and the pain of that abortion. Abortion laid at the foot of the cross is forgiven. This church is a safe place to talk through it. CareNet is a safe place. Contact me. I will talk with you. I want to give you a couple of statistics about how this church body, you included, has helped to change the face of the Treasure Coast area. Through this monthly giving that that you have given um, for nine years since 2015 to date, Discovery Church has given $8,800. That's a really great number. Along with the thousands of services we've been able to provide, which I answered a question after the first service. Well, is that all you do is just, you know, do you help after the baby's born? We do. Come talk to us. We do. Um, With all those services, the most joyful and miraculous result of those $8,800 that y'all have provided in 15 years, $1,000. 50 babies have been saved in just this area. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you because of your love and faithfulness to give to CareNet through the church, individually, whatever you're doing to help. Thank you so much. I want to just leave you with this. Emily's flat tire stopped her from going to the store to pick up the abortion pill that she thought would end the life of her unplanned pregnancy that she was carrying. She just wanted to reset her life to before. But God had a greater plan. Because of that flat tire, as of today, little Eliana is four weeks old. Amen. <laughs> I've just given you a little teaser for our client testimony that will be shared at Karenette's 34th annual gala on March 7th or 8th. Our keynote speaker this year is none other than Dr. Abby Johnson. She's the author of Unplanned and the movie Unplanned. I would love to be your table host. Come enjoy the evening. The tickets are free, but it is a gala. It's a fundraiser, but you will find so much information, and we would love to see your smiling faces, and I will greet you there. Thank you for giving me this time to share, and thank you so much for what you do. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, she'll be around and would love to speak with you um, and answer any questions that you might have. We're thankful that the Lord has brought Stephanie uh, to our church to be a part of this, this church. Look to verse 19. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. So this is the second time the Lord appears to Joseph in Matthew 2 saying, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel because those who intended to kill the child are dead. Verse 21, do you see it? So he got up. That was his response to the Lord. Obedience. So he got up, 
took the child and his mother and entered the land of Israel. Verse 22, but when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in the place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. Afraid as you and I be afraid. Being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the region of Galilee the third time in Matthew chapter 2. The Lord appears. Then he went and settled in a town called Nazareth to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. So this is the fourth and final prophecy fulfilled in Matthew chapter 2. Two. They settle in Nazareth. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 says, Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. What do we do with a scripture like that? <laughs> the stump or root of Jesse. Remember the genealogy in chapter one is Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus is the promised one. Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. Jesus was born in Bethlehem and he grew up in Nazareth. Now, the word branch in Hebrew is netzer. Netzer. It's the same root word that we get the word Nazareth. Same root word which the name Nazareth comes. Naz Nazareth was, was known, or was named as the town of the branch, meaning the, the place where the branch of David lives. And what's so interesting about all of this is that Matthew connects Nazareth with the prophecy in Isaiah at the close here of chapter 2. Matthew connects it all. There's unity in it all. The whole Bible points to Jesus. Nazareth was a place of lowly reputation. We won't talk about any places of lowly reputation other than just to use Nazareth. In fact, it was nowhere mentioned in the Old Testament. Archaeological research suggests that this town was only about 120 at the time of Jesus' life when he grew up. Wisdom and Stature, Luke 2.52 says, it was a town of about 120, 150 people. I mean, you knew everybody, right? <laughs> you knew everybody. It was a small town. It was a tiny farming village. It was high on a hill. It was far from the main trade routes. And it was the last place that anyone would look for the Messiah to grow up. John chapter 1. Verse 45, Philip and Nathaniel. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. And so did the prophets, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Verse 46, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, that was the reputation. Now, what good can come out of this little podunk town, you know? What good? And listen to what Philip said. Come and see. That was a simple response. Come and see. There was something so significant about Jesus being born, the king of the Jews, that the wise men had to come and they had to see for themselves. Hey, in closing, listen. Jesus was, Jesus was born in a mess. I mean, as we look at chapter one or chapter two, Matthew, Jesus is, he's born in a mess. A lot of times we, we think it's the, it's the, it's the perfect scenario. Like the, I got to have the perfect nativity scene, right? Any nativity people out there, I mean, you got the one, you, you've had it uh, all your life or, you know, or passed down or something. It's, it is the most beautiful thing. But as we read this account, what do we see? It was tragedy. It was loss. It was ugly. It was a mess. Jesus was born into it. I, uh, I hope that that will be great encouragement for you and for me. 
take a step back and consider our lives at times, it's messy. I mean, messy. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's some beautiful moments. But oftentimes, the, it appears that the mess outweighs the, the beauty. And if we're not careful, we can stop trusting God through the mess, and we can miss what he has on the other side. I think that's what God does with all of us. We all have a past. You heard te Stephanie's testimony today. Man, we've all missed it. There isn't one person that is not in the need, in need of the grace of God. <laughs> not one. There is not one perfect person, only the matchless one, the king that is over all. His name is Jesus. So my challenge today would be whatever your mess is, would you present it? You might not have the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. <laughs> but whatever you have, would you present it to the king? Would you worship him? Will you trust him? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place? And would you just say, God, what do you want me to do with this? What is my response to this? If you're online, would you do the same? Just pause from it all and just, what is my response to, to this? What do you want me to do with this, Lord? As people are praying across this place, online with us, you're asking God that, that simple question, what do you want me to do with this? What is my response? Maybe you know already, it's the mess. You would just present it right now. You would just present it. You just present it to him. Here's my mess, God. I know you can turn it into a miracle. That's who you are. And so I'm going to trust you through the mess. I'm going to trust that you have a plan for my life. I'm going to trust you. As people are praying all across this place, I wonder if there's one here that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus, and today would be the day of salvation. Today would be the day that changes everything. As we sing this song, as we sing about the beautiful, powerful name of Jesus, that death couldn't hold him. As we sing this song, we declare this truth. There's going to be men and women at the different corners of of this room, and I want to encourage you, if you find yourself today with a mess, hey, there's something powerful about someone else coming alongside of you and praying for you, reminding you that you're not alone, would you have the courage to step out of your seat and find a man with man, uh, man, man with man, woman with women, find a man, find a woman, say, so would you pray for me? Maybe today's the day that you need to surrender it all over to Jesus, confess him as Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Trust him, receive his grace today, and be saved and set free.